Hey, welcome. In this video, I'm super excited to take a really deep dive into understanding the quality of compassion. In this video, we're going to talk about what is compassion, what are the circumstances that allow for compassion to arise, how do you develop compassion within yourself, how do you embody more compassion, and then how do we kind of allow this to permeate our entire culture. So this here is really the most important personal development and spiritual growth topic that exists. Because if you look at every single religion, every single spiritual school, the golden thread that really ties all of them together is they are trying to get you to become more loving and more compassionate. So really, if you want to measure how personally developed you are or how high your level of consciousness is, the key metric that you can use is you can kind of just feel into your heart and feel how compassionate and loving are you able to be towards yourself, towards other people, especially towards other people that annoy you, that bother you, that you hate, that you despise, that you disagree with? How loving and genuinely compassionate can you be towards every single person and not just people, towards nature? and towards the entire universe. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about what is compassion, how does compassion actually arise, and um, how uh, we can embody this in our lives. So the first thing I wanted to do is I just wanted to start off with some quotes from different religious traditions because when, when I was young, I really didn't like religion. I was forced to go to Catholic church and to pray to God, but no one really explained to me why I'm going to church, why I'm praying. All they told me is that you have to go to church <laughs> to be a good boy and otherwise you're going to go to hell, <laughs> right? So I was like, uh, okay, that's not really a good explanation for why I should be here. And it wasn't until I was older maybe until I was about 16, 17 years old, and I started studying spirituality by studying different mystical traditions like Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, until I actually learned about different religions. That was really when I started to truly understand the core of Christianity, which is just compassion. And before the other day, I was on uh, going on my meditation retreat and I was in Shoppers Drug Mart, which is just like the, uh, the drugstore in Canada. And I found this magazine with the Pope's face on it. And normally I wouldn't go near a magazine with the Pope's face on it because I'm a very scientifically minded person. I don't really give a shit about the Pope. Usually it's just some Catholic dogma. So... But th this time, for some reason, I was just called towards picking up this magazine because I've been practicing open-mindedness and I just want to explore many different perspectives that I wouldn't normally feel comfortable exploring just because I want to understand them. So I picked up the magazine with the Pope's face on it. I opened and the first page that I opened up to was a picture of the Pope kind of praying to Mother Mary. And the quote was, when we look upon Mary, we are reminded of the transformative quality, the transformative power of love and tenderness. And when I read that, I was just like, wow, that's so beautiful. Nobody ever told me that when you look at Mary, you are reminded of compassion you're reminded of the power of being loving, being gentle, and being tender and caring towards yourself and also towards 
other people. So this thought I kind of carried with me throughout my meditation retreat and the, the retreat that I was on, we were, it was a Buddhist retreat and we were actually meditating upon the deity uh, Chen Rezi, who in Tibetan Buddhism is the embodiment of compassion. So for basically nine days straight all day, I was doing these visualizations that the purpose of which is to visualize Chen Rezi, who is just the embodiment of compassion. You could say he's literally compassion in its physical form and to meditate upon these qualities and to actually merge with them to become one with them. And this caused me to have a lot of deep insight into the nature of compassion, a lot of which I'm going to be sharing with you today. And right now, I just wanted to share some quotes from the different wisdom traditions where they're all basically saying the same thing. They're all talking about compassion. So we see that developing compassion is a core universal quality. It's not something that is um, owned by one religion, but it's a universal quality. So first, to start with Christianity, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says, Do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. If someone compels you to go one mile with him, go with him too. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who abuse and persecute you. That you may be sons of a heavenly father who makes the sun rise on the evil and the good. And the rain fall on the just and the unjust. That's from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Next, let's talk about what Muhammad said from the Islamic tradition. No one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother what he desires for himself. Now let's look at the Talmud, which is the, the Jewish, one of the Jewish mystical texts. What is hateful to you, do not do to others. This is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Now let's look at the Hindu statement um, from entering the Bodhisattva practice, which we're going to talk about what a Bodhisattva is. My body, its pleasures, and any merit I have gained, I will give without a second thought to help other beings. Let them despise strike, even murder me at will. Let them play with my body. Let me be the object of laughter and scorn, but let no harm come to them for anything they do. May anything they do to me result in benefit to them. May whoever accuses me, curses me, or insults me have the fortune of enlightenment. Today, in the presence of the Buddhas, I invite all beings to this joyful feast till they attain enlightenment. Also, from the Dhammapada, which are the, the sayings of the Buddha, he says, Hatred does not come to an end by hating, but by not hating. I will be assailed by abusive words the way an elephant receives an arrow in battle. And also the, the four qualities of the Sangha, which are the Buddhist community, the qualities of the Buddhist community are, if someone harms us, we do not harm him. If someone is violent toward us, we are not violent toward him. If someone insults us, we do not insult him. If someone accuses us, we do not retaliate. And lastly, the, the little prayer that I started uh, the video with, as long as space abides and as long as sentient beings remain, 
May I, uh, may I too abide to dispel their suffering, which is the Dalai Lama's prayer. So the reason why I share these quotes is really to get you to see that all the religions are saying the same thing. <laughs> the golden thread that weaves them together is compassion. So what is compassion? <laughs> Let's get into it. Compassion is the genuine care for alleviating the suffering of another being. The genuine wish for the well-being of another. This dawns from the realization that another is no different from you. True compassion is realizing that other beings experience the same suffering that you do. I am, I feel pain when I put my hand in a fire. So when I see another person put their hand in a fire, I feel their pain. Especially if I've burned myself before and I can relate, I can sympathize. I actually want to run up to him and, and pull his hand out of the fire. Because I literally see that this person is me. You see that compassion is actually a universal quality, not just a human thing. Even bacteria share resources with each other and give and take to each other. Even bacteria have this kind of generous quality. They're altruistic. So are trees. As well, trees share uh, nutrients from the sun through the roots and whichever trees in uh, their circumference in their area, whichever trees aren't able to get as much sunlight, the taller trees who get more sunlight actually share the nutrients through their roots to the little saplings and to the other trees. So this... You also see symbiotic relationships as well between birds who who like who land in crocodiles' mouths and who pick the the uh, the food out of the the crocodile's teeth, right? So there's little birds that land in the the, the crocodile's mouth. The crocodile could easily eat the bird, but he chooses not to because he realizes there's a symbiotic relationship. He lets the bird pick the crud out of its teeth. The bird gets a meal and the alligator um, gets better tooth health so that there's no crud stuck in between his teeth. So there's all kinds of examples of these symbiotic relationships in nature. And this kind of selfless give and take where we realize that we are here on this earth and in the universe, we survive interdependently. There is oneness. We rely on each other to survive. I can't just take it all for myself. I want all beings to share in my wealth and in my abundance and in my happiness. So what causes compassion to arise? This is very, very important to understand. In the Buddhist tradition and even in the Hindu tradition, there is this quality of the the unity of wisdom and compassion. So even in Taoism, we see the yin-yang, right? So just like the yin-yang, wisdom and compassion are inseparable. They're, they arise out of each other. You can't have compassion without wisdom, and you can't have wisdom without compassion. So what causes compassion to arise is really having deep understanding of the situation, the situation of life, of your own mind, your own psychology, also of your own body as well, and also the psychosomatic connection. Really, compassion arises from having deep, penetrative understanding of what reality is. And understanding is often thought of as an intellectual thing where it's like, oh, if I read enough books, then I'll get understanding. 
but there are plenty of people on Earth who have read thousands of books, but don't really have much understanding. Because books are awesome, right? So I'm not taking anything away from books, but under true understanding is something that's embodied, something that comes from direct experience, right? In the same way, if you want to understand what uh, the, the taste of an apple is, I could write a, a, a thousand books about how an apple tastes. I could use the best descriptive language in the entire English lexicon. But unless you've actually tried an apple, you won't really understand how an apple tastes. You could read the entire thousand page book that I write, but really you won't understand what an apple tastes like until you actually experience it. So I've noticed that compassion is something that spontaneously arises out of clear seeing. When you have clear perception of the present moment, that usually arises from some kind of raised consciousness. So meditation, psychedelics, shadow work, breath work, whenever your consciousness is very clear and sharp, you'll find that compassion spontaneously arises. When you can see clearly, you can also clearly see all of the suffering of yourself and you can clearly see and deeply understand the suffering of other people. And naturally, there's a, a natural want to alleviate that suffering. So when the Buddha got enlightened, he sat underneath the Bodhi tree for 40 days uh, and 40 nights, apparently. And uh, he sat there without moving. And after overcoming all of the temptations of his selfish ego, his cravings, his fears, overcoming and just sitting still and neutral, he achieved enlightenment and he had deep union with all of existence. He experienced all of infinity. He had deep understanding of causation and it's, it's very difficult to explain the Buddha's enlightenment. But basically, when he got enlightened, what also spontaneously arose after his enlightenment was a very deep compassion, a very deep want to share the enlightenment, to share the wisdom with all sentient beings. So out of insight, out of clarity, compassion gen um, spontaneously arises. It's almost like when you're eating a really, really tasty meal, like at a five-star restaurant, you take a bite, the food touches your taste buds and you're just like, mmm. Spontaneously, if, if let's say you're with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and you're eating a meal together, you say, here, you have to try this. You have to try it. Here, take a bite, please. It's amazing. You, this desire to want to share goodness with others is just, it's something that is a deep universal quality. Compassion is really not something that needs to be developed or built. You don't need to add compassion into your life. Really what you need to do is you need to remove the obstacles that obscure compassion because your natural state is deeply compassionate. Also, when you have a relaxed body and you have a clear mind that's not being ravaged by thoughts, compassion naturally arises because you have space. You have space to hold for others. So uh, one example of compassion I wanted to share before we get into the qualities of compassion was um, when I was 18 years old, I, I went on a meditation retreat and uh, one of the teachers there, um, she 
uh, talked to me for the first time. I wanted to do a, a solo retreat. So I was very, you know, macho and uh, I had just come back from Thailand and I did all these meditation retreats. So I was confident in my meditation ability. So I booked a solo retreat at the Dharma Center of Canada in a beautiful forest. I booked a cabin for myself and uh, I said, I'm going to do a solo retreat. And one of the teachers there said, okay, you can do a solo retreat, but I, j I just want to talk to you at the beginning. So I show up at the temple. I talk to this woman and for an hour, she immediately sees that my body was holding a lot of tension. I wasn't really walking properly. I was holding tension when I was walking. I wasn't sitting properly. I wasn't even meditating properly. So she spent an hour with me, just helping me to relax my body, showing me body work practices, showing me how to breathe properly. And I wasn't paying her. She just helped me. I was the only person there. It was just me and her. And she spent an hour or two with me, just showing me how to be in my body, how to meditate properly. And then throughout my solo retreat, she'd come knock on the door once a day and just talk to me for 30 minutes or an hour and just give me her attention and her care. She actually genuinely wanted me to meditate properly and to be happy. Again, I wasn't paying her. This was completely for free. She helped me for seven days straight. And at the end of my solo retreat, she even took me for a walk in, in the forest where we went for like an hour long walk and she just talked to me, just curious about my life, about who I was as a person, what my interests were, what my background in meditation is. So for me, that's uh, an example of compassion that I'm very grateful for. This person, um, she helped me even just for no reason. She dedicated so much time and energy towards helping me. She didn't have to do that, but she did. Another example of compassion would be Jesus helping the, the lepers. Back uh, 2,000 years ago, the, the lep their leprosy was a, um, a very big problem. It is still in some places in the world today, but basically uh, it's a skin disease where your skin like eats itself. Basically, it's, it's actually terrible. It's like almost like imagine your body's decomposing while you're still alive. <laughs> it's, it's hell. And um, nowadays we have cures for it, but back then it was a big problem. So uh, in, in the, the towns 2000 years ago, they would kind of annex the, the lepers in an area of town where they'd almost quarantine them, where uh, no one was allowed to enter because it, it was contagious. What Jesus would do is he'd actually enter into the that area of town and he'd hang out with the lepers. He'd talk to them. He would just he would teach um, the the good news. He would preach to them. He would talk to him about God. And some of the lepers he even healed. And this was at great detriment to Jesus because if you went to go hang out with the lepers, you would be scolded you would be looked down upon because you're hanging out with like the, the lowest caste of society um but jesus would go hang out with them ever anyways just to help them because he loved them because he realized that he he is them he genuinely wanted to help them so that'd be another example of compassion all right, so let's get into what are the qualities of compassion? This is something that I was really contemplating a lot on my retreat. First of all, you notice that compassion is almost always selfless. Because what is the self? What is the, the ego? The ego is that thing that basically holds you separate from the rest of reality. The ego is the part of you that thinks that you are the, the king of the world, that you are in the world and you're just like some character that's 
exploring an environment, but you don't feel connected to the environment. You don't feel connected to the other people. You just feel like you are in your own little bubble. And if you can get more food or more resources or more sex, then that'll be awesome. And if other people get more food or resources or sex, you don't really care because all that matters is your own selfish survival and your own selfish pleasure and greed. So com true compassion is almost always selfless. You can really um, judge the embodiment of compassion is, can you be compassionate when it is not in your best interest? Because sure, everyone can be compassionate when everybody's looking. When the cute girls are watching, sure, yeah, you can be compassionate. You can give a few dollars to the homeless man on the street. But how about when nobody's watching? Can you help the homeless man on, on the street? When there's nothing in it for you. Even if you are about to go buy yourself lunch and you have $10 in your wallet and the homeless man asks you for $10, or do you give him that $10 even at your own cost? Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of people um, are doormats where they are t overly self-sacrificing, where they give, 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 give too much of their energy to other people. That's not what true compassion is. Really, that's actually selfishness. You're just afraid of setting boundaries with other people. So you're not being very compassionate towards yourself if you're being a doormat or a people pleaser. So being a people pleaser is not compassion. Being genuinely selfless is compassionate. Helping others not to get validation, but just because you see, clearly you see, that person you're helping is you. You're helping yourself. I'm a, I'm a very um, physical person. I'm a very touchy person. My love language is touch. I really, um, when I want to connect with someone, I always put my arm on their arm or put my hand on their back. I, I like giving people hugs. I feel um, very loved when people give me hugs. I just, I'm a very touchy kind of person. Mm. And um, when I feel another person has body tension, I, when I hug them, I just kind of energetically help them to relax their tension because that's just pure selflessness. I am relaxed and I hug you. I feel your tension. I want you to relax as well. I want you to let go. I, there's no need to hold on to tension. I want you to kind of just surrender to life because it's peaceful and it's enjoyable. It's blissful. So this is an example of just, it's just a very natural, spontaneous thing. When you feel someone else is very tense, you just naturally want them to relax. You want to give them a massage so that they can relax their body. So compassion, it just arises naturally. Also, compassion is indiscriminate. It's not only compassionate towards a specific group of people, and then all the other people can go fuck themselves. It's indiscriminate. Right? So stage blue and spiral dynamics, people who are very nationalistic, they are very compassionate towards their group, towards my family, my religion, my countrymen, but they're not very compassionate towards the other religion, the other country, the other group. They think they're evil. True compassion sees no evil in the world. There's only delusion and suffering. Evil is just delusion and suffering. And it's really just the desperate need for more love and light in that area and acceptance. Also, compassion is very, very patient. Not being so so impatience really is attachment to the end result wanting to hurry up and get to the end result but true compassion is very very patient 
If the person you're trying to help doesn't get it, it's all right. You'll sit with them until they get it. It might take two hours. It might take a week. It might take a month. The Dalai Lama's prayer, or actually we can look at the, the Bodhisattva vow, which is um, great compassion. However innumerable sentient beings are, I vow to meet them with kindness and interest. However inexhaustible the states of suffering are, I vow to touch them with patience and love. However immeasurable the dharmas are, I vow to explore them deeply. deeply. However incomparable the mystery of interbeing, I vow to surrender to it freely. From this day forth, with wisdom and compassion as my lamp and staff, I dedicate all my life energies to the welfare of all beings. Patience. I vow, however innumerable the states of suffering are, I vow to meet them with wisdom and compassion and patience and kindness. Compassion is understanding. You know when you walk by someone on the street and it's just like a regular person, let's say you're walking down the street, you walk by a middle-aged woman and uh, you don't really think much of it. You're just like, oh, it's just a person. And you just walk by. But imagine as a thought experiment, right when you walk by that person, as kind of a flashback, you are able to experience their entire lifetime. Imagine just for... Maybe in a split second, you live through their entire life from when they were born to where they were at walking by you on the street. You see their family. You see their upbringing. You see all of their struggles, all of their suffering, all of their joys. You literally live through this person's entire lifetime. You understand them deeply, just as deep as, even, even deeper than they understand themselves. If that happened to you, you would feel the deepest love. You'd start to cry. You'd feel the deepest love and compassion for that random person that you just passed by on the street. Why? Because you understand them. Compassion arises. The thesis of this video is that a compassion arises out of understanding. When I do psychedelics, sometimes I, I, I get into states where I, I really, through understanding my own shadow and my own suffering, my own fear and greed and cravings, understanding all my own bullshit, I am also able to deeply understand that all the human beings are suffering with the same things that I'm suffering with. And it's just naturally wanting to share and share um, this compassion. So compassion arises out of understanding. Also, compassion is open. Very open. Not closed off and tense, just very open. Allowing whatever appears to appear, whatever cloud passes in the sky, just letting it pass. Compassion is not very um, pointy or very particular or very anal about the way things need to be. Compassion is very open and loose. That being said, on the other side, compassion can also be disciplined and, and dedicated as well. Compassion also has this quality of receiving as well. Can you really receive the present moment? So if you look at the screen right now, or if you look at whatever's around you, can you just look at the screen without trying to see something on the screen, but just kind of receiving the sight? Kind of just relax your eyes and just allow the sights to just appear. Notice that just because your eyes are open, you don't have to try to see. 
seeing just happen spontaneously and effortlessly. And just allow, give yourself a moment to just receive that. This kind of receptive quality is very compassionate. When you're speaking to someone, when was the last time you truly received another person without trying to change them or, or manipulate them or judge them, but exactly as they are, warts and all, just receive them with love. Compassion listens to the other person, seeks to understand genuinely what's going on in your mind and in your body and just in your consciousness, right? Seek first to understand, then to be understood. As a coach, one of the core skills that I need to practice all the time, the main thing is just whenever I talk to someone, I'm listening and I'm genuinely curious. I genuinely want to know, hey, what's going on in your life? What's going on in your mind? I need to understand. I want more information. Like a scientist studying uh, some species of uh, bacteria that you've never seen before. You need, I actually want to know what, what's going on. Now, I'm not trying to judge you or criticize you or even change you. I just want to create an open container where you can be seen with love and acceptance. Compassion is non-judgmental. Compassion is also kind. Compassion is soft and, and nurturing. This kind of softness. This is something that really needs to be felt, not something that needs to be spoken about, but if you can just kind of allow your heart to soften, if you can visualize light in your heart, if you maybe go to some beautiful place of nature, Go to a beautiful forest. It's a sunny day outside. The birds are chirping. It smells like morning dew. Your heart actually softens. You become very soft. You don't have to hold yourself against nature. You actually want to drink in that experience. You, you become relaxed and loose. You become soft. Compassion is accommodating. Compassion allows for space. Compassion is loving. Compassion is present, fully present here with you. Imagine you're sick, right? You have the flu and your mom comes in the room and she, she, she comes, she sits on the bed. She feels your temperature. She genuinely wants you to feel better. And she, even better than that, uh, she just allows you to be sick and just provide support and encouragement. So this kind of open space is very nurturing, is very accepting. This is your true nature. This is what God is. This is what your awareness is. It's compassion and openness. Also, compassion is, is very clear can see clearly. There's no self-will. There's no fogginess of, of desire where you're always chasing after the next moment. You're just fully present with the person or with the environment or just with yourself being seen, allowing yourself to be seen without judgment. Compassion is also free. You can do whatever feels right in the moment. And if you're truly open and aware and conscious, you'll notice what usually feels right are loving and selfless actions. So when I say you can do whatever you want, people get scared. They're like, what? You, are you telling Adam, Adam, are you telling people that they can do whatever they want? They're free? What well, you're saying, so then you're giving people permission to murder me and to, to you know, commit crime? 
Well, the point is that when you're truly free and you're just open and relaxed in the moment, you don't want to commit crime. You just want to experience and give love. Now, people who are in difficult survival situations like in Africa, in lower um, states of consciousness because they, they're, they're, the survival conditions are more harsh, not that they're lesser humans, but their, their consciousness is, is more selfish because they need to be like that in order to survive in those harsh conditions. If you give that person freedom, right, the, the warlords with, eight, with armies of child soldiers with AK-47s, if you give them freedom uh obviously they run amok and they um they commit all sorts of um atrocities but still if you want to fix this problem step one is to understand the psychology of what's going on in that warlord psyche you need to understand something like spiral dynamics or developmental psychology you actually see what is going on in the human psyche why are they the way that they are? Realize that if you were in their position, you'd be the same way. Once you understand why their mind is doing what it's doing and why they're taking the actions that they're taking, then compassion spontaneously arises. And from that place of understanding, true understanding, then you can take a very clear um a very good action to help them be liberated from their suffering also compassion is uh, not contrived it's genuine it's it's like not i'm not acting compassionate it's not a show that i'm putting on oh look how compassionate i am it's hey like i actually just want to help you because I see that you're me. There's a recognition of oneness. Not that I'm going to act compassionate so that I can get something else out of it. <laughs> the compassion, there's no strings attached. That's the key. It's just compassion just for compassion's sake. Compassion holds space. It also has this kind of going more towards the wisdom side of compassion. It's also very penetrating. You can see deeply right into the core of the problem to fix it. If you want to help alleviate suffering, you can't just be all airy-fairy, Oh, I love everyone. Everyone come give me a group hug. Let's take our shoes off and go dance in the forest. Okay, that's fun, but in order to really alleviate deep suffering, there needs to be a quality of wisdom. There needs to be a, a kind of discriminating intelligence where you actually understand what is causing the suffering, what is causing it, and how can we kind of massage and soften and, and um, see this this mechanism that's causing you suffering when and when you can see it and accept it and learn about it and be curious about it it kind of lim liberates itself so compassion is not really about fixing problems it's more about understanding life and trusting that just through pure understanding problems tend to fix themselves a lot a lot easier <laughs> If you understand how a car engine works, all you have to do is take a wrench and just do a couple screw turns because you see what the problem is, so the solution is a lot easier to implement. Whereas if you don't understand how a car engine even works, you're going to do something stupid. You're going to take the whole engine apart. And when really all you had to do is just put in some gas. <laughs> so if you want to help other beings, you need to have deep understanding. All right, um, uh, quick intermission. I have to change my camera battery. We'll be right back with the rest of the qualities of compassion. All right, we're back. Also, 
compassion is non-aggressive, right? So I just watched uh, that video of Will Smith uh, slapping out Chris Rock uh, because he was um, kind of poking fun at uh, his wife's um, uh, baldness because she has a skin disorder. So um, Will Smith got really, really, really flustered and, and felt like he had to defend his wife and he kind of stomped up on stage and just fucking slapped the shit out of him. And Chris Rock was like, what the fuck it just happened? And he started yelling at him and swearing at him. So compassion is non-aggressive and non-violent, which is why I see this is all over the news because intuitively we, you know, we look at celebrities, right? And we think, oh, celebrities, you know, they're who we want to be like, right? They're in the God realm, right? We, we want to, every, their life is awesome. We want to strive to be like them. And yo, I have so much respect for Will Smith. He's such a cool and smart guy. His biography is amazing. <laughs> uh, but he's also human, right? And, and we see Will Smith, right? You know, getting just worked up by his anger. And the truly compassionate thing to do here is not to say Will Smith you should have been more compassionate. The truly compassionate thing to do would be to say, Will Smith, I understand that sometimes it's very, very difficult to be compassionate. And even though in that moment you weren't able to do it, I still accept and love you for that anyways. So you see all the YouTube comments are like, oh, Will Smith, you know, his, he, he deserves to be, you know, you know, kicked off of television or like whatever. He deserves punishment. Wow. Isn't that so funny how you saying that Will Smith deserves punishment are using the same mental structure that Will Smith used to go slap Chris Rock. <laughs> he thought, oh, Chris Rock deserves punishment for talking shit about my wife. <laughs> so you saying Will Smith deserves punishment, see how you're actually the same as him? Isn't that interesting? Right, Marcus Aurelius says, the best revenge is not to be like that. So Will Smith, Yo, like, we love you, man. And if you actually read his apology, it's 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 very heartfelt. And someone was like, oh, his PR agent wrote it. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you can actually, Will Smith's a very smart man. You, you can feel, um, you can feel the heart that was in his apology. And it's like, yeah, dude, it, it's fuck. Like, we make mistakes, right? And if you zoom out really far, if you want to be really compassionate, let's look at the blessing that that was to, to have a celebrity on stage go in and to slap out another person, isn't that so beautiful that we get to see ourselves in its raw, pure form, right? We, you know, a lot of celebrities, you know, they talk about, oh, pray for the war in Ukraine, in Russia, right? You know, nonviolence, uh, peace, right? P we pray for peace. Yeah, I, I agree. I we pray for peace, right? War is tragic. But it's, but you know, if you want peace in the world, right? First, you need to have peace in yourself, right? So, uh, you know, the celebrities all talk about peace, right? But then, you know, Will Smith, you know, goes and fucking slaps the guy out. You can't even, you don't even have peace at the Oscars. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you're at the Oscars and you can't even be peaceful, um, how, uh, how can you be peaceful, uh, you know, in, at war, <laughs> right? In more serious situations. So yeah, I'm not talking shit about the guy. You know, I'm, I'm actually speaking from compassion. I completely understand. I sometimes say rude things to people. Sometimes when I was younger, I even hit people, right? I get it. I fucking get it, right? And that's the point is that I get it. That's compassion. Also, compassion is very playful. It shit is just not a big deal, right? So again, Will Smith, he could have just laughed it off. Okay, yeah, this guy made a rude joke. But again, if you want to understand what's going on, the poor guy's wife has a, a, a skin condition, a disease. And 
Chris Rock's up here, you know, making fun of her, you know, his wife, her feelings were hurt, right? By his joke, he felt defensive. He's like, fuck, this guy's making fun of my wife in front of everyone, in front of the whole world. I have to stand up for her. I have to defend her, right? And obviously, it would have been better if he just kind of laughed it off and said, you just gave his wife a hug and just say, it's okay, babe, you know, whatever. It's a joke at your expense. Not cool. Whatever. We'll just laugh it off, right? That probably would have been better, but we can't always see that right when you get in that hot headed state, can't always see that. But, um, in any situation, the more playful you can be, the more you can approach a situation with a sense of humor, like it's just not a huge deal. Um, the more open space you leave for compassion, because one of the enemies of compassion is seriousness. Well, another word for seriousness is uh, self-agenda. When you're very attached, you're very serious. You have a uh, you're very attached to the outcome of a situation. You can't be very compassionate. You can't be receptive. You can't be open. You can't go with the flow. You can't be playful. You can't make a joke about it. Right? Compassion has this very light and playful energy. Sometimes, uh, there's this story of uh, the 10 ox herding pictures, which is like the Zen uh, model for enlightenment, right? On, on the last stage of enlightenment, the highest stage of enlightenment, the, the monk uh, returns to the marketplace. He doesn't show off his meditation. He, he just wears regular tattered clothes. His chest is all dusty. His, there's grime on his face. He just looks like a regular peasant. He, the, the enlightened monk who's been meditating his whole life goes in, into the marketplace and he doesn't show off being enlightened. He just laughs with the people. He sits with them. He, he drinks with them. He sings with them. He plays with them. He tells stories to them. And this, this deep, hearty laugh, this just genuine, pure joy, the, this enlightened monk laughed so hard that you think that his, his jaw will fall off. He just such a deep, genuine, pure joy and laughter that everyone around him is returned to their good nature and returns to their own Buddhahood just by, just by hearing him laugh. This playfulness is uh, very transformative and um, this non-seriousness um, is very compassionate. Also, compassion is just in awe at the beauty and the profundity of existence. You ever just looked at some moss on the rock, but just like looked really, 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 really close, just super, super, like extremely close where your eyes can actually zoom in further, right? Maybe you're on a psychedelic or maybe you're just meditating a lot, right? I find when I meditate a lot, my senses increase. I become more sensitive, right? Another quality of compassion is to be sensitive. What does that mean? To actually be clear, to be sensitive, to pick up on subtle things that most people will miss. So your your eyes, your ears, your mouth, uh, your taste, your smell is all more sensitive. And also uh, your energy, you can pick up on subtle energy as well. You can feel when somebody's suffering in the room, right? When you meditate a lot, right? You can feel other people's agitation Right? If someone's like tapping their foot or they're like just really like anxious and, and nervous and they have certain vocal inflections. Right now I'm tapping my foot. I feel super anxious, right? You see another person do that. You can be more sensitive to those little subtle cues and uh, you can really help them not by going up to them and say, hey, stop tapping your foot. You're, you're too impatient. <laughs> You just can help them by just laughing with them, being there with them, loving them, not wanting them to change, but just seeing them and loving them, making them feel included and 
making them feel good. So back to the last point, compassion is very in awe at the beauty and profundity of reality. Also, there's a sense of honoring. I think bowing is, is very important. It's just a very important physical practice to do, to do prostrations or just to, to, to bow yourself down. I sometimes bow to the Buddha, right? Because that represents bowing to my own mind, my own awakening, my own awakened mind. The Buddha represents my own awakened mind, right? So bowing, right? Out of humility, right? Reverence, respect, right? Those are all um, qualities of compassion, right? Seeing another person on the street as God, as the Buddha, as Jesus, treating them as such. And uh, those were um, many of the qualities of compassion. All right. So now let's talk about what are some of the obstacles to compassion? Uh, it's basically just the opposite. Uh, selfishness, greed, wanting more for myself, taking away from others, not caring if others have enough, just, you know, eating all the food, not leaving any, anything left for the other people. You don't realize that in the next life, you're going to be that other person who had no food because you ate it all, right? Uh, other obstacles to compassion are craving. Also, um, materialism as well. So first of all, craving. Craving is just really wanting the present moment to be different, trying to get to the present moment. But remember, a compassion is accepting the present moment exactly as it is. So craving really is um, the opposite of compassion. Also materialism as well. So materialism is not just buying a bunch of stuff, but really what materialism is, is seeing the world as being a material object, thinking that physical objects actually exist. Like this, this glass here is actually a physical, tangible object that is made of material. That's a giant obstacle to compassion because it's actually false. This is not made of material. It's actually made of consciousness. It's made of pure experience. Material is just a thought, <laughs> just a concept. This glass is made of pure experience. It's not made of material at all. People would get confused at this point. I've made a lot of videos in the past, but they say, but Adam, then how can you hold it? If it's just made of consciousness, shouldn't it just fall through your hand? No, why can't consciousness imagine that an object doesn't fall through my hand? Why can't consciousness imagine a solid object? Like in your dreams, right? When you're walking in your dream, why don't you fall through the floor? It's just made of your mind anyways. It's because your your consciousness is so infinite that it could even impose limitations on itself. It can impose rules and boundaries on itself. Right? People say, Adam, if if right, so right now, right, materialism, right? I want right now I want you to actually touch something. Touch some object. Touch it. Right? Could be your body. Touch a, a physical object. And people say, oh boy, I how is this made of my mind? How is this made of consciousness if I can feel it? If it's solid, it feels solid, Adam. How, how, is, how is this made of consciousness? But you're not actually aware. What is this object made of? Let's break it down. It's made of, I'd say, a few things. First of all, it's made of sight. It's just made of the, the sight of it. Secondly, it's made of uh, concept as well. So there's sight and then there's also an idea. What is this thing? Oh, it's a pen. It's a black pen. Pens are for writing. I like pens. Oh, I don't really like this pen though. This pen, I wonder if there's ink in it. I wonder what I'm going to write with this pen. See? So there's, there's um, uh, the sight, the pure sight, and then there's concept, right? Which is um, what you think the thing is. This is a solid physical pen. I'm a human being. I live on earth. 
I'm a physical human being who's 22 years old, who is a male, who is holding a pen on planet Earth in the year 2022. And see, that that's what you see. It's all It all comes in. I live in the solar system, through the galaxy. So this, this whole metaphysics comes in when you look at this pen. So I just wanted to point out this pen is made of sight, it's made of concept, and it's also made of feeling as well. When you feel it with your hands, any object is the same. Feel it with your hands, there's a feeling, right? So I want you to pay attention. What is this feeling, the sensation of touch? What is it? It just, it just, it's not a word. <laughs> so don't look for a word answer. It's like, oh, it's neurons. It's not neurons. Just look. See, it just is feeling. Feeling is just feeling. It just is what it is. Is feeling solid? Is it material? Not really. It's kind of just like, it's kind of like a ghost. Just like kind of comes and goes. Like a, right? Also sight, right? Is the sight solid? Not really. See, it's just like, uh, like frames per second. You know what I mean? And then also concept, ideas of material objects. Are those ideas solid? What are those ideas? They're just like mental sounds and images. They're not solid. Okay, so this pen, the only, <laughs> what this pen is made of is is sight, concepts, and and feeling. N but none of those things are solid. So how can you say this pen is solid if what it's physically made of is not solid? People might say, oh, but Adam, what if, what if we study the molecules? What if we take a microscope and we go really deep and we can break it down chemically and actually see the molecules? Okay, sure. But that sight of molecules, <laughs> is that solid? <laughs> when you see a molecule, is that solid? Where's the molecule occurring? It's just occur occurring in your imagination. So reality is not material. And if you think it's material, that it's a giant obstacle com to compassion because then you think that the world is like real, that like we're not all one. We think that things are separate from each other. This breeds fear. Where there's other, there's fear. That's what they say in the Upanishads. Another obstacle to compassion is fogginess and numbness as well. When you're numb or when you're just unclear, you're foggy. Maybe you did an exercise that day. You didn't meditate. Um, you feel foggy. You, you can't be compassionate because there's no space to hold for another person. You can't, you can't accommodate them. Ignorance as well. The opposite of understanding. Thinking you already know what's going on in the environment or with another person and then trying to impose your ideas onto the world before you actually observe what's going on. It's like you're trying to fix a car engine, but you haven't read about how car engines work. You haven't spoken to any mechanics, but you already know how car engines work, right? You don't want to be humble. And then you think to fix it, you need to, you know, hit it with a sledgehammer and then you break your engine. And then you're like, fuck, why isn't my engine working? Ah, oh, maybe, maybe it's a bad engine. The engine's broken. Let me go buy a new one, right? So you don't even admit that you were wrong. Ignorance. Also, a big obstacle to compassion is fear and lack. And this is actually going to move us into uh, creating a compassionate world because when... We have a society where people are really struggling to meet their basic needs, right? We have 1% of the, the wealthy people that are making billions and billions of dollars of profit. And I saw this crazy video yesterday about inflation in Canada, right? So in, in the United States, inflation has been a, a, a big problem for the last year. The gas prices like doubled, right? The food prices have, have gone up and um, people are just like inflation. What, what the hell's going on with this inflation, right? And then we, we, we have someone, some idea to blame. Oh, it's the liberals fault. Oh, it's Joe Biden. Oh, it's Justin Trudeau. Oh, it's China's fault. Oh, it's this person's fault. But wait, hold on. Wait a second. 
this awesome video I saw that basically just showed that really what inflation is right now is that companies are just raising their prices. They're just charging more and just saying that it's inflation. And they're just, they're like quadrupling their profits. So the, the CEOs and, and the shareholders are, are make are making like hundred billion dollars of extra profits. Um, and they're just saying it's because of inflation. So anyways, it's not going to, uh, we're not going to go super deep into politics right now, but the, the point here is saying that when people are living in lack, where this food's too expensive, gas too expensive, how rent houses too expensive. There's no way you can be compassionate because people are afraid of not having enough, afraid of having to go live on the fucking street, fighting and clawing for, for, for resources, right? So that's a big obstacle to, to compassion, right? And you can see that in areas of the world where resources are scarce, like uh, perhaps in Africa, where all the wealth is just funneled up to the king or the monarch or... Um, you know, the government's super corrupt. They just take all the wealth for themselves. They don't re-spread um, it back out to their people. They don't invest into their people. They don't build infrastructure. They don't build roads, plumbing, electricity, healthcare, courts. When you don't invest in your country, right, people are stuck just fighting and clawing <laughs> with at each other creates all sorts of violence and suffering for everyone and, and that eventually trickles back up to the government people are naive the people at the top sometimes you can be naive and and be sitting on your mountain of gold thinking oh you know i don't really need to redistribute this wealth to so that all beings can be happy and be free from suffering because as long as i'm good and my family's good and my company is good, and my shareholders are good, then I don't have nothing to worry about. But you don't realize it's all interconnected, right? Your son, right, might go to a school, and since maybe the education system could use more work, it allows kids to fall through the cracks. Maybe some kid is being raised and his parents are in desperate poverty, there's not a lot of government support for them to help them with education or with healthcare or whatever. They're paying all out of their own pocket. They're, they're living in depravity. They pass all of that terrible energy onto their kid. Their kid goes to school with your kid and uh, shoots up the school. You might say, well, Adam, I'll just, I'll just send my kids to private school, but you you don't understand you're going to be driving down the road one day and you're going to get robbed or the point is that when you live in a in a in a poor country <laughs> even if you're the richest person you you're still only as poor as the poorest person in 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 your country because it's all connected right if think about it if if more people have more support more more you know more affordable tuition more affordable health care, more affordable daycare, dentistry, right? They don't have to pay out of their own pocket for that stuff. It's just there's more support from the government. There's also more regulation, right, on the excesses of business, right? So businesses like uh, the phone companies, like in Canada, we have the highest phone bills on earth, right? Guys, we're talking about compassion here. We're talking about building a compassionate society. We have the highest phone company uh, phone bills on earth uh, in Canada, or one of the one of the highest. Um, the reason why is because the the phone companies have monopolized the entire phone industry. If you need a phone, Rogers has already bought all of the the smaller companies. There's no competition. There's just Rogers or Bell, and and both of them have basically agreed we're just going to keep our prices super high, and both of us are going to make a lot of money. So we're paying like $80 a month for the phone. So um, the point here is that when the government can regulate the excesses of capitalism, like for example, not allowing companies to monopolize and to buy up all the competition, keeping some healthy competition, that helps to keep prices competitive. 
right? So the free market, what that eventually turns into is that turns into um, the, the, the strongest, the richest, just sitting on the top and then kind of enforcing and enslaving everyone else and just buying them up. Um, and that doesn't work because then you're just being ruled by one company's greedy, selfish agenda. But um, when you can regulate the excesses, obviously the free market's still good. It works. We need some capitalism in our society, but the excesses need to be tamed. They, 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 they can't go off into, you know, billions of dollars of profits and just like hoarding it and moving it in, into, into Ireland or to Scotland, hoarding it in tax havens and, you know, avoiding tax loopholes, pay, paying lawyers to, to, to deal with lawsuits, lobbying the government, paying the government not to pass any regulations. See, this is completely run amok. It's completely it's just selfishness run amok. So a more compassionate society, um, the government is, is more strict with business laws and um, is very, very interested in redistributing wealth to the, the common people, right? The, the society is made up of common people. So the society is only as successful as the common people are. Also, this benefits everyone. So if you think about it, if more people are not just fighting and clawing to get by. Maybe if we only had to work four days a week instead of five days a week. That works in some Nordic countries like Finland and, and um, Sweden. Even for school, right? Kids go to school. Just make them go to school four days a week. They don't have to go five days a week, right? Make the school day shorter so that they can play and just enjoy their life. When people are just not always stressed out about making ends meet. They can be more compassionate. They can also be more creative. They can be more spiritual. They can be more loving. They can make better art. So you as the rich person sitting on the mountain of gold, you'll actually, you actually have a lot less art that you can gorge your senses with because all the people that could have been making art, they can't because they're, too busy working at the grocery store. That's paying them uh, not even a living wage. So when the common people are helped and are raised up, everyone is richer for it. And that's very important. That needs to be understood. So that's, uh, that's for politics, how to create um, healthy politics. Also, guys, if you actually study um, the political theory and you actually look into the policies and you see, okay, what are these parties? What do they want? You see the conservative party, they say, okay, we need to give business more freedom, more area, more room to, to move around basically. So that, you know, the trickle down effect so that they'll create with the businesses, get tax cuts and all this stuff, the, the, the very expen the very, um, Rich businesses, not talking about small businesses. Small businesses are very important, right? That's is for the com po common people have small businesses, but the giant businesses, the monopolies, the huge businesses. Yeah. Let's give them some tax cuts. Let's give everyone tax cuts, right? And just, we'll just let everyone do their thing. You know, the free market will do its thing and then whatever. See what happens when you, when you have that kind of mentality is that the, the strongest always rises to the top and then enslaves all the, all the poorest. That's what always happens. So we need regulation, right? If you look at the more left-leaning parties, they're not perfect. If you look at liberals or even NDP in Canada, the, the more liberal-leaning parties, their policies are literally, let's make school more affordable. Let's make it free. Let's make um, healthcare more affordable. Let's make dentistry um, more more affordable. Let's give people free childcare, right? So a lot of the, the main critique here is how are we going to afford this? We can't afford to invest in free tuition for the population. <laughs> See, you don't understand the, the, the country has the ability to go into debt, right? And debt is not necessarily a bad thing. Some countries like Japan, for example, have the most debt. They have a lot of debt, but they also have some of the highest quality of life. 
So debt does not equal bad life. Debt is something where you basically borrow to invest in your future because you trust that your investment will pay off in the future. So there's nothing wrong with debt, right? Obviously, we need to not be wasteful with our money and just spend it willy-nilly. But you see the countries with sometimes very little debt also have very low quality of life. And one thing is that a country's debt, most of it's actually owed to its people. So when the people are actually willing to lend to their country, they, that means they trust their government is going to invest it back into them and make their lives better. In, in the West, I feel like we don't have a lot of trust in our government, right? We're not even willing to lend to our government in bonds and, and stuff like that because we feel like the government's not even going to use it properly. They're not even going to give it back to us. So more left-leaning parties who are actually talking about, um, even if you think of, of the word, <laughs> let's think of the words, ready? Liberal, open, liberal, we're more liberal, Right? Or you can think of more conservative, we're con trying to conserve, right? <laughs> we're trying to keep and conserve, we're afraid, right? So there's this, this big delusion, I can talk about this all day, but um, there's this big delusion where we think liberals and conservatives, it's just like, pick your poison, you know, it's just whatever your opinion is, you know, just whatever your preference is. But no, if you look structurally, not just from the levels of consciousness, Right, but also just from the effective political practices, we can look at countries with the highest quality of life, like in in uh, in Europe, in uh, like Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, and stuff like that. They're leaning a lot more left than we are, and that's because the left in general is more about compassion. It's more compassionate. It's more about spreading the wealth for everyone, and. There's this trick that happens where conservatives think that what they're doing is spreading the wealth to everyone. Yeah, we're going to cut everyone's taxes. Everyone's going to have more money. But that's not actually what's happening. You have to look at what's actually happening. Not what you say is happening. Not what you think is happening. <laughs> what's actually happening. Right? So we can't talk about politics the whole episode. But it's, it's important to just keep that in mind. All right? Next, let's talk about compassion in business. All right, so if, if you're a business person, you're starting a business, um, or you're just business in general, uh, if we want to bring more compassion to your personal business or to businesses in general, the main thing we have to ask ourselves is, what do people need? What can I help people with? What service can I provide that people genuinely actually need that's going to actually help them? See, a lot of people get business ideas. Like, what's some cool idea for some gizmo or for some knickknack that I can patent so that I can sell it to people and, and make a huge profit off of it? What kind of app can I make that, you know, addicts people to, to you know, and just kind of, siphons money into my bank account. Whereas compassionate business, which is actually a lot more sustainable and works very long term, compassion on the surface might seem soft, but the tree that bends is the one that actually stays up. So this the, 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 the compassion is the genuine care for your customers that never gets old. <laughs> That's a great business model to actually genuinely care about what your customers want and then giving it to them. <laughs> That's that's business in a nutshell. And sometimes even compassion and business can turn into leadership as well. Where my, I realize my customers don't even know what they want. Let me help them. Let me give them a, a, a path forward. Let me lead them into a, a better future, a better tomorrow. Right, that's uh, another way you can uh, set up uh, your business. Leadership is just like realizing people are fighting in depravity and suffering. People are ignorant. They're 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 living um, lives of quiet desperation. 
I, let me raise myself out of that so that I can lead other people and help them and show them that the way they're living now is causing them suffering. I have a better way. Follow me. I'll show you. So compassion in business is actually caring about your customers, not tr not like sitting at home thinking. So if you think about marketing, the main thing marketing teachers always, always teach you is actually figure out what your target audience wants. You have to interview them. You have to ask them. You can't sit at home thinking in your head, what do people want? Cause then you're not going to give them something. You're going to give them something you think they want. But in order to know what someone wants, you need to interview them. You need to survey them. You need to go over their house. You need to talk to them. You need to ask them, Hey, what's, what do you, what's your, what are you struggling with? Where do you want to be in five, 10 years? What's your goals? What have you tried before that hasn't worked? How can I provide a better solution for you? So this is compassion. This is active listening genuinely caring what your, your audience wants or your, your target audience wants and then delivering that to them. Compassionate business will make you rich. Also, um, okay. So compassion in relationships. This one I think is kind of easy to see. Um, when you are with a partner and this actually could be with um, your friends as well, your parents, your school mates, your people at work. Compassion in relationships is, is genuinely caring for the well being of the other person, listening to them, holding space for them, being playful, laughing, and not being judgmental. And in relationships, especially intimate relationships, this can get very, very hard because in a, in a deep intimate relationship, you are living usually so closely together and, and you're so, you've kind of taken off the protection, whatever layers of protection that you put on to keep yourself safe when you go talk to strangers or whatever, those layers of protection are kind of penetrated when you have a deep intimate relationship and that person is like really heart to heart with you. So, if there's almost no layer of protection. So if they do something that bothers you, it's like a big problem because they're really like right beside your heart. And if they do something that bothers you, it's like, it goes right past your defense system, your security system, and it just gets right into your soul. And it just, next thing you know, you're arguing about spilling salt on, on the table or, or, um, doing some other frivolous, petty thing, right? So Relationships are a great place to develop compassion by um, being unconditionally loving and uh, accepting of yourself and also of uh, your partner. Not trying to change them, just accepting them and loving their quirks and their warts and, and their um, annoying aspects. Also, communication is very important. Compassionate communication is... First, uh, first and foremost, built on listening and is also built on honesty as well. So when you speak, you're honest and you're authentic and you're not hiding. And then when you listen, you're non-judgmental and open and interested and curious. If you can kind of develop that, um, that will uh, create some amazing communication. All right. Compassion in your health. This is uh, a lot of things... A lot of people aren't very compassionate towards themselves and you can't really be compassionate towards other people if you're not compassionate towards yourself. And a great way to be compassionate towards yourself is just by eating healthy and really taking some time just to research like what healthy foods are there? Um, should I be eating waffles for breakfast? and candy for lunch and then pizza for dinner uh is that very compassionate towards my body this marvelous work of art this this the most complex piece of technology 
that has ever been invented, the human body, is that uh, a, a compassionate way to uh, thank God for his hard work? <laughs> you could say, or her hard work. So being compassionate towards your body also has to do with stretching, right? Exercising, meditating, loving yourself, your health. And also um, being aware of what kind of air you're breathing, what kind of water you're drinking, and what kind of food you're eating as well. Now, how can we be more compassionate to the environment? Well, there was a great practice that uh, Sadhguru shared with me um, through his book, Inner Engineering, was that people can't really care about the environment unless they have a direct experience and feel that they are interconnected with the environment. As long as people feel separate from the environment, they can't care about it. So a great practice that you should try is just to sit in front of a tree for five minutes or 10 minutes, just sit in front of the tree and become conscious that the air that you're breathing out is the air that the tree is breathing in. And the air that the tree is breathing out is the air that you're breathing in. And just sit for five or 10 minutes with awareness of that cycle. that uh, will create a lot of compassion uh, for the environment and just loving the environment. First of all, exploring nature, I think is something a lot of people miss out. The reason why people litter or why people don't really care about the environment, they say they care the, about the environment, but they don't. The reason why is just because they don't really spend enough time in nature. And uh, I think all of us can do a little bit more work um, with loving the environment. But keep in mind, you can't really care about the environment until you kind of get your basic needs met. So if we really want to help global warming or environmental pollution, we need to help the people meet their basic needs so that they can actually raise to the level of consciousness, spiral dynamic stage green, where they can actually care about the environment. And even yellow and turquoise, even higher, to then to actually do something effective about it. All of that comes from raising your consciousness. Also, um, compassion in art as well. When you're making art, this is a big one I, I've, I've noticed in myself and on YouTube as well. Um, there's the kind of the content boom where everyone's making content. My mom, every, your mom's making content. Your pet is making content. Everyone's making content. But the question is, what are you making content for? Are you just trying to like get views to raise your subscribers? How are you trying to help people? What problem are you trying to solve? What change are you trying to make in another person's life? How do you want them to emotionally shift from coming in contact with your art. So compassion in art is really the best way to do art because this genuine, this heartfelt sharing, that's what makes the best art because when you come from the heart, that's something that's connected to the rest of the universe. It's very centered. You can flow energy through your heart onto the paper or onto the the, the song or into the video or whatever it is when you're just coming from your mind only where you're like, Oh, I'm just trying to, what's the best art I can make so that other people will like it so that I can get views and subscribers. You're selfish. You're not being compassionate. You don't actually care about what people need or what they want or you are even helping them. Even if you're singing or making entertain entertainment, it only works if it comes from the heart and you're playful about it and you're enjoying it, you're in the moment, you're present about it. Not that you're doing it so that I can make money, right? True art is not a formula. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a genuine, authentic expression of you, of God. And it's captured and shared for the benefit of all. 
also compassion in science is is kind of similar science is just really studying and learning about what is reality and how does it work what's going on here and and being accurate about it not making mistakes trying to really get to the truth of things trying to make accurate documentation of your experience basically and science is very powerful we, we, we can use it to fly to, to Mars and uh, create smartphones with extremely advanced technology but science and technology is usually um, only harnessed for by businesses who can profit off of it because it's expensive to build a smartphone to research how to fit the battery into the phone so that it stays cool and so that it holds a charge and uh, so that it quick charges and and all these all these moving pieces that the screen the, the the camera in these smartphones nowadays is like ooh, amazing it's, it's insane you're holding uh, a Swiss army knife of a, of a device in your pocket and that's awesome. And the only reason why this technology gets so much funding is because it's so profitable. But compassion in science is funding scientific investigation that actually is geared towards helping the needs of all people. Not just if there's some immediate profit in the near future. Because scientific research re requires a lot of funding. So... If we want to use science to help people raise their consciousness, to become more compassionate, to really tap into their own compassion, because really the highest compassion is helping other people realize their own compassion and for them to be compassionate as well. If we want to do that through science and technology, we need to realize that um, the end goal isn't always profit. Sometimes when you invest just in people's hearts and in their consciousness, in their personal development, then that actually pays long-term dividends for everyone, not just for your pocket. And um, also, uh, lastly, I'd say compassion in uh, spirituality is really... Uh, the main thing that spirituality is. What is spirituality? One way you can define it is the development of wisdom and compassion. And not even the development of it, but the uncovering of it. The recognition of one's inherent wisdom and compassion. There is no spirituality without the development of wisdom and compassion. If we're talking about crystals, creating energy fields, doing, you know, astrology or whatever, dancing in the forest, there really is no spirituality that's going on unless we're really talking about self-sacrifice. We're talking about um, genuine deep insight, grounding in your experience and... Uh, helping alleviate the suffering of all beings even when it's not convenient for you a lot of modern spirituality nowadays is just hedonism it's just like oh let's go be spiritual let's go do ayahuasca and we'll just we'll just hug each other and yeah that that's great it's great um um but be careful not to turn that into hedonism where it's just like oh we'll just buy nice crystals and and uh skip around and and talk about spirituality really how can we help alleviate the suffering of other people that's really um spirituality and also deeply understanding the structure and the nature of of, of this moment here of of existence so yeah we're going to talk about that more in another episode let's get into the practices that you can use to uncover your natural compassion because even little children are naturally very compassionate so first of all uh meditation uh is very important raising your consciousness and uh being aware of the now doing yoga doing psychedelics any 
practice that raises your consciousness um, will help you develop your compassion for all the reasons that we've spoken about here. Relaxing the body as well. Body work is something that's very, very important that I'm going to be covering extremely in depth in my coaching program because all those exercises you need to be talked through and uh, I'm excited to really share with you how to actually relax your body using these techniques that actually allow consciousness and compassion to flow into your body and through it. So body relaxation is very awesome. I'm going to make an episode about it in the future. And um, the next practice is listening to another person with genuine interest. Not waiting to say something. <laughs> waiting for them to stop speaking so that you can get your foot in the door and, and say something. But actually letting what they say really hit. Really chew on what they're saying. And being curious, inquiring deeper. Holding space for another person. Also, just respecting people that you, you talk to at, at the grocery store or at, at, at the coffee shop. Just making eye contact and being grounded and smiling and just being there and realizing you're talking to yourself. Hi, how are you? Good, awesome. Yeah, can I have a coffee, please? Thank you. Right. Um, also, um, yeah, I already spoke about the breathing with the tree exercise. That, that That's a good one for the environmental compassion. Also, reading and understanding spirituality, psychology, politics, life, shadow work, life purpose, creativity, law of attraction, etc. All of the relationships, business, understanding life, reading as a habit and never stopping reading. There's no point in your life where you're going to be like, oh, I don't want to read anymore. Reading is for fun. Reading is something joyful. It's not something that's a job that you have to do. Reading is a habit that if you really want to be a, a wise human, you just got to read a lot of awesome books. Who would have thought, right? So um, that's uh, that's a very important practice, reading and understanding. Um, also, um, uh, studying your own psychology, self-reflecting, learning, uh, and um, doing shadow work is a big one. I have some videos about shadow work. Shadow work is really about owning and accepting the parts of yourself that you hate. And also owning and accepting the parts of reality and of other people's selves that you hate. So whenever somebody else is triggering you or bothering you or stirs you up, that's some unhealed shadow material that you can really reflect and say, this person behaving this way really bothered me. How, what does that say about myself? What does that say about what I don't like about myself? And how can I own my, sh uh, my shadow material instead of projecting it out onto other people and criticizing Will Smith for being violent towards Chris Rock? How can I r use that as a contemplation on my own violence? Where am I violent in my life? Am I violent to myself? Am I violent with the dishes when I go wash the dishes? Am I violent with them? Am I violent when I brush my teeth? Am I violent with my tone of voice when I talk to my family? So that's shadow work there. Seeing what triggers you in another person and then contemplating it, realizing it's yours. <laughs> and um, the last... Uh, practice would just be contemplating uh, what I've spoken about here and just contemplating reality in general. It, it's really interesting and uh, needs to be explored, right? That's why you're here to explore and to uh, experience life, to be playful. Like a kid, right? If you, if you drop a kid into a jungle, he's going to have the fucking time of his life. It's like everywhere you look is just beautiful things. There's ants, there's flowers, there's animals, there's, there's trees, there's, it's, it's amazing. 
<laughs> right? So that having that kind of attitude, even when you're not in the jungle, even when you're just walking down the block or you're on the subway, that uh, raises your consciousness and helps you to develop compassion. All right. So to overview, uh, compassion really is the great ideal of life. And it's spoken about in every single wisdom tradition. All the religions are saying the same thing. The golden thread that weaves it all together is compassion. And compassion is just genuinely caring for alleviating the suffering of another human being. It's a universal quality. It's not a human thing, but compassion is something that is actually part of the universe. And the deepest compassion that I haven't spoken about yet is um, realizing what God's compassion is. God is so loving and compassionate. God is love and compassion. And think about how loving and compassionate God is to give itself, to give you the opportunity to experience life. The, the rare, the precious and valuable opportunity to experience life in the human form. It's fucking amazing. It's fucking amazing. All the stuff that you can see, the art that you can enjoy, the, the relationships you can make, the, the, the things you can learn, the, the nature you can explore the food you can eat, the sex you can have, that's the ultimate compassion. Think about how deeply compassionate God is to, to, to make, to, to invest billions of years of evolution, billions of years of just figuring out how to like make elements and how those turn into single-celled organisms and then they had to fight for billions of years to evolve into multi-celled organisms and then that eventually evolved into complex beings into fish reptiles evolved into um uh birds mammals uh, evolving the the reptilian brain into the limbic system emotions getting complex prehension and eventually evolving into the neocortex which is the most complicated piece of technology that has ever been invented ever, invented by nature, the human neocortex, the amount of connections and patterns there is in, in unfathomable. Think about how much effort and just concentration and time it took <laughs> to do that. Obviously, God is infinite and omnipotent, so it really didn't take that much effort. <laughs> and it's actually... A, 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 a natural outgrowth of just infinity. Um, but just appreciate that. And uh, don't take that for granted. And don't waste your life doing um, petty shit, wasting your life in, in conflict and uh, squabbling, right? Develop compassion here while you can um, so that you can help other beings do that as well. See, here's the thing. Uh, last point I wanted to cover, I'm glad I remembered, is that when we practice meditation, we're not meditating for ourselves. So even the word personal development, there's no person that we're developing. Spiritual growth. See, we, we kind of, we make spiritual growth into some kind of vertical process, but it's actually not vertical at, at all. It, it's actually vertical it's down where it's deconstructive personal growth development isn't about building yourself it's actually about taking yourself apart to to see what the fuck is going on to understand yourself i want to see what myself is how did i get to be a self in the first place what is life you need to understand what life is so that then you can make an awesome one So when we practice meditation, we, we meditate for all sentient beings. I'm not meditating for me so that I can 
live better so I can be more woke. That's what I used to do for years. I'd meditate just for me so I can be better. But as I really started tapping into the essence of meditation, I realized I'm not meditating for me at all. There's no me to meditate for. I'm meditating for everyone else. So you not meditating, right, is is not just like you're missing out on on growing your consciousness. Really, you're every you're making everyone else miss out. They're they're missing out on you helping them. So spiritual growth is is something selfless. We're growing and developing ourselves for the sake of others. And it's not for my sake. I'm good. I could just fucking <laughs> chill out and, you know, go work at Starbucks and and never read, just play video games and, and eat chocolate all day. If I wanted to, I'd survive, I'd get by. But it's not about me getting by. It's about me transforming myself into someone that can help others experience love and compassion for themselves and have deep understanding of what reality is and to be curious and to feel like a kid again and just to explore life. And um, that's why uh, we put so much effort into understanding compassion. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, that's all I have to say here. I make uh, new videos like this every single week. And stay tuned. Really, I've already kind of told you what I'm doing here, but I'm basically developing myself or not really developing myself, I'm more deconstructing myself. And uh, the purpose of that is to understand life and myself on a very deep level so that uh, I can fix my life and so that I can help other people fix their lives as well. Speaking of which, I'm working on my group coaching program. It is almost ready. It's gonna be launching probably on April 3rd. So stay tuned, I'm gonna make a big announcement when it's out. I'm super excited to share this work with you. It's going to help you embody higher states of consciousness. We're going to cover holistically your body, your mind, and also your spirit as well. So I've been putting a lot of energy and spending really years to kind of gather all these practices that I'm going to be guiding you through in the coaching program. Um, yeah, so I'll let you know when that's out. And uh, besides that, I'll see you in the next video.